Dear viewers, today we have a very special guest, Professor Owen Duna. We thank the professor for taking the time off from his very busy schedule and joining us in Task TV. Professor Dunan is professor of art history at California State University at Northridge. Since 1996, he has directed the Sinop Regional Archaeological Project. And since 2015, he has directed the Sinop Kale excavations under the auspices of the Sinop Museum. He has authored more than 40 articles, a monograph, Sinop Landscapes, and received numerous grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities, from the National Geographic Society, American Research Institute in Turkey, and other sources. He served as the George M. A. Hanfman Lecturer for the Archaeological Institute of America, 2016-17, to and has received fellowships from the NEH, the Getty Institute, and Alexander Humboldt Foundation. He received his PhD from Brown University in Old World Archaeology and Arts, and Bachelor and Masters of Arts from Tufts University in Classics and Classical Archaeology. His languages are German, Italian, French, Turkish, and Latin, in addition to English, of course. He has a wide range of research and teaching experience in top institutions in the US, Italy, Germany, and Turkey, and did field work in Turkey, Mallorca, Italy, Greece, and Israel. I'm proud to say Professor Dunan was a task embassy role lecturer at the Turkish House in Washington, D.C. in November 2018. Due to great demand, we had to do two lectures, one evening after another. He was also on our task TV earlier on the Perspectives program. His CV runs about 18 pages, and it was so full and diverse, I learned some archaeology while reading it. Um, I just wanted to add one other item. Professor Dunan organized a colloquium for his team of young Turkish archaeologists on the romanization of Pontus and Bithynia for the prestigious Archaeological Institute of America's annual meetings in Washington, D.C. in January 2020. Professor Dunan was proud to point out that it was very impressive that the talks were accepted because only about 30 percent of the talks submitted are accepted in any given year. He also proudly pointed out that his distinguished team of archaeology came from the relatively new universities in Anatolia. Dr. Emine Serkman from Hittite University in Choro, Dr. Shahin Yildirim from Barton University, Dr. Yujal Shanyurt from Ankara Haji Bayram Veli University. The colloquium was held on January 5th, 2020, and it was very successful and very well attended. Without much uh, talk, I would like to give the floor to the professor. But first of all, I would like to thank our technical team very much, uh, without whom we could not put those programs together. And thank you to all. So, Professor Duna. <laughs> yes, are. indeed. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be back with you. Um, uh, back on Task TV and and back with uh, with you, Oya Hanum. I'm uh, so pleased uh, to uh, to receive this invitation for today. Um, I, I also uh, found it so interesting as we were preparing that uh, we we uh, that your daughter uh, shares with me a uh, a mentor, uh, Professor Martha Joukowsky from Brown University. Uh, uh, who is um, who was um, such a uh, an amazing mentor to so many Turkish 
uh, students over uh, over many many years at, at Brown. So uh, that that was a nice um, a nice thing to learn today. So um, yeah, today what I'd like to do is uh, give a version of a talk I gave um, about a month and a half ago at the Louvre in in uh, actually a, a Louvre sponsored colloquium in uh, uh, in Marseille. Uh, in E, and um, it's uh, the subject is really very uh, interesting, very important. I think uh, in even even over the past month, it's become more so. Uh, could I have the first slide, please? So, um, so what we're going to be looking at is evidence for early fishing uh, in uh, in Sino. Uh, and thinking about that as the origins of a Black Sea mariculture uh, and the origins of ancient uh, tr ancient trade in the Black Sea. Uh, next slide, please. So, of course, this um, this uh, crazy mucilage outbreak that has been causing such havoc uh, this summer. Uh, has uh, has really had a tremendous impact on on fishing among other things and um, and so what we're what I'm talking about today is a, the three or four thousand year history of fishing in the Black Sea uh, based on the evidence we have at Sino and um, and and so really the the environmental um, the impacts these days uh, of, of of the great heat, uh, which is also impacting everyone, uh, and, and and other things are are um, you know they're impacting a, more than a four thousand year tradition, uh, and and so that I think is uh, is, is quite uh, uh, you know it underscores how woven together the past and the present uh, can be. Uh, could we move ahead? Next slide, please. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, say first off uh, that um, that what I'll be talking about today is a synthesis of work of my whole team, uh, including scholars from more than 10 countries. Uh, we are uh, pulling together right now a volume on Sinokale excavations 2015 to 2017. Uh, that will present uh, a comprehensive look at, um, uh, at, at our results uh, for those uh, first three seasons. It's very exciting. Uh, we're, we're just um, pulling that uh, volume together. Um, that's what I'm doing with the rest of my days uh, over this particular summer. Uh, next slide, please. So, I want to start out uh, sort of underscoring a couple of basic ideas, and I won't go into the weeds on the on the theory here because I realize this is a a, a more general audience than uh, at the at the Louvre's uh, uh, scientific um, uh, congress. But uh, the first idea I want to uh, introduce is the idea of mariculture, and this is a concept uh, of um, the, the way that people use maritime space, the way they, they settle near the sea, the way they uh, conduct fishing and hunting and shipping, trade and all these other uh, kinds of subcultures that are all very much woven in with the sea itself. The, um, uh, uh, Vesterdal uh, uh, developed this cultural approach uh, particularly with uh, respect to the North Atlantic cultures, but it, it also is, I think, quite valid as we try to understand the history of the Black Sea. Basically, um, uh, mariculture uh, includes all those things that people know about the sea that are so essential to the um, to the successful uh, sailing and uh, uh, navigation, um, learning when the fish are uh, coming by, when, when the migrations happen, uh, when different resources are available, and, and so forth. So mariculture uh, was very essential underpinning for uh, the uh, eventual 
emergence of the Black Sea economy. Okay, the second underlying point uh, is that um, there's very special kinds of relationships between mobile, um, sea-oriented people and, uh, and, and sedentary, settled people uh, in the coastal environments. And this was developed by a scholar named Bergsvik uh, in, a, in a paper in 2009. And, and so one thing we're going to pay particular attention to is the way that um, the, the mobile uh, sea-oriented people and the local settled people um, develop strategies for interacting together, uh, creating uh, you know, productive relationships. Uh, and, and again, that is in many ways owing to the uh, the long history of uh, of prehistoric fishing that predates um, the the, uh, the colonization of the Black Sea uh, by the uh, settlers from the city of Miletus. Okay, the third point that I want to start with is that places that seem marginal to us might just be a tiny little mini island or some rocky point that seems really rather awful to live in could uh, and do often play a really important strategic role uh, in um, in the maritime geography. So so even a place that seems like it's at the end of the world to us might actually be quite um, quite important uh, in um, in a maritime geography. So so I, I, I hope you, you're getting the idea that living with and by and integrated with the sea um, is, a, is a mindset. And until that mindset is developed, it can be very uh, challenging to live successfully uh, by the sea. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to go quickly through some of these other slides because I don't think we have to really go into the weeds on the um, uh, on the theory. But um, but I, I really uh, want to emphasize that trade and exchange are cultural systems. We think of them as, you know, somehow rather different from culture. Um, you know, there's economy, which is serious. And then there's culture, which is sort of, you know, what you do after work. Well, trade and exchange are actually within culture. They're, they're, they're cultural systems. They're the, um, the material-based ideas of value as a way of uh, material value, um, say, in metals or other things that, that are considered valuable. Um, these, are, these are really forms of social storage. Um, and and so, um, so the cultural systems uh, are, are, are really what we're interested in economy being a, a subsystem of culture. The second point uh, that um, that the pre-colonial or prehistoric uh, systems and patterns of movement and interaction created the cultural infrastructure for later trade systems. And so um, so these different communities that were coming together, the mobile versus the uh, sedentary uh, indigenous groups uh, came together. They created relationships and strategies for relationships that were essential to eventually developing what we would call um, a trade economy. And then um, uh, one thing that's often ignored is that the indigenous uh, people who are living in a place um, in, in a sedentary way um, are just as proactive and just as uh, important as their agency in, um, in the entanglement between the different economic communities. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so, um, so one of the things about the Black Sea, which is absolutely fundamental is that it has great diversity in terms of rainfall, in terms of geography, in terms of 
seasonality, um, potential crops, and so forth. So it's um, naturally the kind of space that people uh, will uh, will profit from exchange and trade. Um, there's a, a natural synergy possible uh, with a robust uh, and, um, and and um, and 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 sort of positive relationship between the different parts of the Black Sea. This is a rainfall map uh, that is um, uh, that that is uh, showing the very high levels of rainfall along the Turkish Black Sea coast and the Caucasus coast versus the low rainfall uh, up in the uh, Eurasian steppe and uh, uh, northern. Uh, uh, Romania. And, and so uh, that diversity leads to a kind of synergy. Next slide, please. Um, the, the fish also take advantage of the diversity of the Black Sea. And so different, um, different species of fish, in particular, the uh, bonito or palamut, uh, and the um, uh, and the little anchovies or humsi, uh, they migrate on very regular seasonal uh, bases, and um, and actually it's the seasonal migrations of the fish that really drove this cultural development that we're talking about today. Next slide. Okay, and this is just um, uh, showing the. Uh, uh, the, the Bonito uh, migration patterns, uh, the former slide was showing the Hamsi uh, patterns. And so uh, each species of fish has its specific time frame, uh, its specific um, uh, sort of way of moving through space. And the, the part of the prehistoric mariculture of the Black Sea was people learned where the fish were in different seasons in different parts of the sea so that they could um, effectively uh, uh, fish uh, and take advantage of this incredibly valuable resource. Next slide. Okay, now we're coming to Sinop. Uh, Sinop, which was the, uh, I like to call it the nexus of Black Sea communications uh, from about 2300 BC uh, all the way to the outbreak of the Crimean War uh, in 18, well, 1853 is when the, the Russians came and sank the Ottoman fleet in a surprise attack uh, at Sino. And so um, it was an absolutely essential node of communication in the Black Sea through those uh, thousands of and thousands of years. Uh, the, um, the location of Sino here uh, and the highlight up on the top of the slide shows the site of Sinokale, which is the fortified uh, the core of the ancient and medieval city that uh, is where we have our dig. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now, uh, for uh, about 20 years before we decided to dig at Sinokale, which is highlighted by that big bullseye at the top of the map, um, we conducted surveys uh, in the highlands and in the coastal areas, uh, sampling different areas to get a sense of where um, people were living in different time periods over the course of uh, about 10,000 years in Sino. The oldest sites we found are, are, are Paleolithic, so more than 10,000 years old. The, um, the great majority of the sites we found were actually Roman and late Roman sites, um, just to give you a very quick picture. Um, we found about uh, 100 Iron Age and Bronze Age sites in the, in the hinterlands. Um, next slide, please. And one of the things we were always curious about was whenever we found these sites, they were obviously small places, you know, maybe about 50 meters across, maybe four or five houses, um, but they would have pottery that looked like pottery coming from very far away, from the Caucasus Mountains, from 
southern Russia, from Bulgaria, from the area around Troy, all over the place, uh, like this little mound at Kojugos, which has a, quite a diverse assemblage. Um, it's from about 2300 BC, and most of the pottery uh, connects at Kojugos over towards uh, uh, the, the Caucasus area and Georgia and, and so forth. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. So about four kilometers away is another little mounded site, Guluavlu. Uh, and Guluavlu, on the other hand, uh, had pottery that was parallel in some cases to southern Russia, to the Yamnaya culture. Um, it was parallel to the Karanova VI culture of Bulgaria, uh, the second level of Troy, and some examples that seem connected to uh, central Anatolia. Just amazing, because again, this is just a little mound, maybe four or five houses at the most, uh, and not, you know, we're not looking at a trade hub here or anything. So we wondered what was going on. Next slide, please. And, um, and, and really what we had to start thinking about was something that wasn't trade going back to 2300 years BC um, was going on in these little sites. They were getting connected to people from Romania, from Bulgaria, from Russia, from Georgia, from central Anatolia. Somehow they were connecting with people like that. Uh, and so we developed this theory of migratory fishermen, a migratory fishing culture that that went around the Black Sea, uh, and um, uh, and one of the places uh, somewhere on the Sino promontory uh, would have been, uh, you know, maybe an important part of that network of fishing sites that uh, that these migratory fisher folk. Uh, we're using. Next, next slide, please. So, uh, in 1997, we discovered the Sinop Kale site. Um, uh, the the Sinop Kale itself is very well known. It's the most visible ancient thing in Sinop. But um, but what we found was this little scarf that you see here in the photograph uh, that had prehistoric houses on it. And what fascinated us about that was that two things. First of all, the pottery was all connected to the northern part and the western part of the Black Sea. There wasn't any local prehistoric pottery in there. Um, and the second point was that the architecture, these little stone pit houses, was also coming from the north of the Black Sea and the west of the Black Sea. And so these two bits of information um, really clinched the importance of this site, right? Because we didn't find this pottery or this architecture in the 70 or 80 Bronze and Iron Age sites that we had uh, that we had recorded in the main part of the Sino mainland. It was just in this little spot. Okay, next slide. Uh, here's a just a detail of that scar. Next slide, please. And another detail of the, the drawing of the two pit houses that we excavated in 2000. Next slide, please. OK, we can keep going. Uh, here's some more of the pottery. Again, this is pottery that's typical of the north and the west of the Black Sea. Next slide. Next slide, and yeah, we can keep going. So in 2015, um, it took us 15 years to get our permit uh, to start excavating here. And we were absolutely thrilled. Everything was coming together. Uh, we uh, are so happy to have the collaboration of the Sino Belladie um, and um, uh, the former mayor, uh, Baki Ergu, uh, was uh, instrumental in securing the uh, the, the permission to dig a tiny little sliver of land just to the west 
of the synocale uh, that we see uh, uh, right here. Um, and, and so that was, uh, uh, that was the, the beginning, we hope, of a long and exciting uh, uh, collaboration uh, with the people of Sino, uh, the um, um, uh, Barish Aihan, the current Sino mayor, uh, has uh, also helped us expand our area of excavation uh, to about tenfold um, a, a large area uh, that's uh, controlled by the city uh, that they've turned over for us to uh, start digging, hopefully when all this COVID uh, business is over. Anyway, we, you can see we opened up three uh, trenches and a couple small things uh, in 2015 and 2016. Next slide. And, um, and this area in the red triangle that you see here, very small part of our dig, but it had incredibly important finds. It was packed with Bronze Age and Iron Age finds that prove the beginning of the city of Sinope, or the beginning of the, the settlement of this place, uh, as early as 2300 BC. Next slide, please. Uh, so we found these early Bronze Age uh, figurines uh, from, uh, from our excavations in that little sliver uh, uh, at the edge of the site, uh, and indeed they have uh, uh, nailed down uh, with, without a doubt, an early Bronze Age start to this settlement. Fascinating. Next slide. Uh, other finds uh, also tie in with the idea of fishing. So on the left, we see a bone fish hook. Um, uh, at the top, we see a, um, a stone blade that could have been used for many different purposes. Um, and we see a loom weight, or not a loom weight, but a spindle whirl. Um, also early Bronze Age style uh, here uh, in the middle uh, of the slide. Uh, and all of these have uh, functions uh, as part of a, uh, a fishing culture. For example, the spindle whirl, which is normally taken as a sign of, of a domestic setting where women might be working with wool. Uh, next slide. Uh, oh, uh, go back one, please. Yeah, uh, could also be used by fishermen who, anybody who knows fishermen knows, they spend the whole winter, all of their time working on their nets, right? If your nets aren't perfect, the fish get away and you've ruined your season. So, um, so all that weaving evidence probably ties in with net maintenance. Perhaps also some of them could be used as net weights. Uh, next slide. Okay, now here's some of our handmade pottery from the excavations, uh, uh, which also showed a great uh, diversity in terms of styles and uh, and, and uh, technologies. Next slide. And so, um, so we have this uh, exciting, diverse uh, picture of the early years of Sinokale. Now, as we move over to the other side of the trench, to an Iron Age or maybe an archaic uh, period a pit house. Um, uh, in the red square there, you can see the little uh, line of one of the walls uh, on the left-hand side of that red rectangle. Uh, next slide. Uh, we found deposits of, um, uh, of ceramics of a hastily abandoned um, uh, settlement. Uh, and, and these have been crushed down, but left enough intact for us to sample the interior of the pots. Next slide. The style of the pots uh, tied in uh, with an Iron Age style typical of uh, the Samsun area, about 150 kilometers uh, east. Uh, the Bafra and Samson uh, region, uh, and in particular, a very famous excavation uh, by a German team at the site of Oymaaj, or uh, Vizir Kapru, uh, is the name of the town. Anyway, those ties suggest these pots come, at least most of them come from um, the early part of the first millennium BC.
Um, uh, we, we have a running debate um, among the team. Uh, I, I think they should be before uh, any of the uh, Ionian colonists arrived uh, at Sinope, but uh, some of my colleagues aren't quite so convinced. But this jar on the right-hand side was really interesting. Next slide, please. Because the, the soil analysis inside the pot yielded what I think may be one of my most um, beloved finds in my whole career. You see those little sand grain-like dots? Well, we have this one wonderful graduate student who, who was even able to find scales from Hamsi in her uh, soil uh, analyses. Uh, and these are, these are the uh, vertebrae of Hamsi uh, that were stored within the pot. And so we were able to show that they were probably storing, probably salting or pickling Hamsi uh, as early as 1000 BC in this site. Next slide. There's a close-up so you can see what they, what these vertebrae actually look like. It, it's a miracle that they found them. Anyway, it, luck is made rather than, um, uh, rather than just randomly encountered. Okay, next slide, please. So, so this find also not only was inspiring to me, but um, the, the local community actually celebrated 3,000 years of fishing and pre preserving fish at the site by opening up a uh, Lacerda festival. Uh, and every November now, the, uh, the, the people of Sinop uh, celebrate uh, this, uh, this Lacerda festival where they have wonderful salted fish. Um, and uh, you can see the pot on their uh, poster here is actually one of the pots from that little trench in our excavations. Okay, um, uh, next slide, please. So after we've discovered this pattern at Sinokale up in the top right hand of these three pictures, then we start to compare those results to a couple of other places down in Gerze uh, to the south and uh, the little town of Aquiman uh, to the west. Uh, and we found another of a number of other similar sites with similar architecture and pottery. So it's clear that there were a number of these fishing spots around the, the Sino promontory uh, that, that probably had pretty similar uh, patterns. Uh, people coming from far away in the Black Sea, staying there and, um, and fishing on a seasonal basis. Um, and we know because of the, the species of fish that were uh, found in our excavations, so far we can say that the, that the fishing was mostly done in the late fall and early winter, October, November, December. Um, and so that's also very interesting uh, because anybody who spent time in the Black Sea would probably not think of that as the most enjoyable time to be out in the water. So, so I, I guess you're, uh, you know, you really, you, you really have to want it if you're going to be passing over the Black Sea in late November. Okay, uh, next, next slide. I'm going to skip ahead uh, several slides because I don't think we have to rehearse all of this evidence over and over again. Um, so uh, let me just uh, advance again. Because I think the main concept is clear. Next slide. Next slide, please. And uh, again, next slide. Um, I'm going to keep going through a number of these slides at this point. Um, and so uh, we have this theory that I think is pretty well, I, I wouldn't say it's demonstrated, but it's, it's established as a strong working hypothesis 
that nomadic fishermen uh, from around the Black Sea were coming to Sinop uh, for seasonal fishing. And they were coming from different parts of the Black Sea. Um, pottery and other kinds of objects with stylistic parallels from Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, and the Samson area uh, were all found on the site. The, the, um, and this created a knowledge base. These, um, these uh, fishermen created a kind of knowledge base about navigation, about seasonality, about how to interact with local people, and so forth, that formed the basis of the Black Sea economy. We know in the late 600s BC that colonists came from the city of Miletus in western Anatolia, the most famous city of ancient Ionia, and they founded a colony at Sinope, they founded colonies in southern Russia, they founded colonies in Romania and Bulgaria, and and then almost immediately they started trading with each other. So my argument is that some of these things we've seen together today are evidence for the prehistoric connections between people that made it possible for the later colonists from Miletus to come in and, um, and, and create a robust and flourishing trade network that was one of the most important sectors of the ancient economy. And so I think I'm going to stop there. Oh, uh, could we cut all the way to the last couple slides? I, I would like to thank a few people. I, I think it's important. And, We'll jump all the way, maybe last two or three slides. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Again. Yeah. Keep going. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, we can keep going here. This was an idea I wanted to explore. And um, if you want, Oya Hanum, you can ask me about the archaeological ecosystem. But let's uh, let's keep going. Next slide. Again, another, another, and one more. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. So uh, uh, and okay. So uh, here we are. I just wanted to, uh, uh, to before closing, it's really essential in my view of archaeology that professionals like me and like my team have to partner not just in name with local communities, but in completely, I think, um, uh, completely together in spirit as well. And so um, uh, we have for decades uh, been very, very interested in finding the interests of the local community uh, and, uh, and uh, trying to bring positive results to the local community, positive uh, experiences. So um, uh, last year or in 2019, just before the COVID outbreak, um, uh, Barish Ihan, the mayor of Sinop, Barish Cardenas, the member of parliament from Sinop, joined us at the Explorers Club in New York uh, for the presentation of a reproduction of the famous field, uh, shield of Farnakes uh, in the Getty Villa, which um, Professor Alex Bauer from Queens College had his ancient metallurgy class produce a one-to-one -one gorgeous copy of this uh, great treasure um, which is has connections to uh, to the history of uh, Sino and so that will be a uh, uh, kind of a symbol of our collaboration with the local community next slide 
So I'd like to thank the people of Sinop, including the people not only in the government. Uh, next slide, please. But also uh, the, the people uh, in the, the cultural scene in Sinop, including our museum director Hussein Rall um, uh, and uh, culture director Hikmet Tosun, uh, also members of the Sinop community for their support. Next slide. Um, and uh, and also people who are doing uh, all kinds of handwork that supports our project. Uh, the, the craftsmen, the regular people, the Hulk, Sinop Hulk, uh, are so important to our um, uh, to to our sense of community uh, together with Sinop. Next slide, please. And so uh, thanks also to my team. Uh, incredible, wonderful group of collaborators. Uh, again, uh, actually over the years, coming from 15 different countries uh, to uh, all to uh, come and uh, work together in Sino. Next slide. And uh, and, and finally, our, our sponsors, of course, we have to thank them. Uh, uh, most prominently, uh, the Culture uh, and Tourism Bacanle, uh, Sino Balibu, the Sino Bevedie, uh, Sino Museum, uh, and uh, important sponsors, both our universities and the, um, the NEH, National Geographic, uh, the British Institute, and other um, financial sponsors. And thank you so much for your attention. And now, Oya. <laughs> Fascinating, time. really. I mean, I, there's so much potential there still. It's just just the beginning, it appears like. Thank you. Very comprehensive uh, talk from the very early times and uh, all the way down, including the economy and the fishing. The La Kerda part really got me. <laughs> I miss <laughs> Turkish so much. You know, that's so one much. of the things I'm most proud of, actually, because it's it's like, just you know, they yeah. they loved it and they were clearly inspired by it. I mean, I'm sure they would have had their Lacerda festival anyway, but you know, it it was so wonderful to have them use our pot from our dig as their their symbol. You know, that was really fun. Now, what is the future plans for you? Now, uh, COVID is not totally gone. Uh, what are your plans in regard to the Black Sea now? Well, uh, so what we've uh, what we've obviously had to put everything on hold with COVID. Um, there were there's almost no archaeological activity in in especially with the international teams in Turkey this year, uh, and and it it would have been irresponsible to bring you know, students and colleagues from all over the world uh, to Turkey uh, and then multiply that, you know, by hundreds of digs and so forth. I mean, it would have been a recipe for um, <laughs> something really scary happening. So um, so next year, if everything goes as we all hope, um, the Sinop uh, de has uh, granted our team you, uh, the right to excavate a much, much expanded area. And it's an area that we've done ground penetrating radar, and it looks like the little prehistoric village, which was admittedly very chopped up in that little area we've dug it so far. Um, it looks like that prehistoric village extends into that area. So that would be such an exciting um, continuation. And then we also are planning on uh, excavating uh, in an area where really well-preserved monumental architecture, um, uh, I mean, big stone architecture uh, is, is uh, documented by another ground penetrating radar study that I directed um, back in 2012 actually and and so that will be um, that will open up a new chapter in the history of Sino uh, in, from the time of these very colorful historical characters like 
Diogenes the cynical philosopher or um, Mithridates the, uh, the 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 uh, incredible rival of Rome. Uh, so so you know that will that will open up a really colorful time in the history of Sino, which um, despite how, how you know how exciting and famous some of these characters are, um, there's nothing on the ground to see yet. Uh, it, it, it's still there to be excavated, and that's a, a, a thrilling prospect. Next June, uh, I'm organizing a symposium in Sinop, uh, bringing about 15 uh, renowned scholars. I, I'm, I'm going to be the least renowned of all of them <laughs> to Sinop uh, to, to have a, a wonderful colloquium dedicated to Mithridates the the great the, um, the 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 king who was born in Sinope and uh, and made it his capital uh, when he when he decided to take what's known as the Pontic Kingdom, uh, uh, which was based in Amasya as as I'm sure you know, and and he moved the capital to Sinope because he wanted to go from being a land mountainous empire or kingdom to a to to an overseas empire and Sinope was the place where he could uh, achieve that and so uh, so we're going to have this wonderful uh, colloquium in June uh, in Sinope and we're organizing a book to come out from that uh, we've got our um, excavations will then follow uh, right upon their uh, and uh, we also are proposing to uh, to help the museum uh, to um, uh, preserve and restore some uh, really world class finds that I, I I can't talk about too much because they're you know they're museum digs <laughs> and uh, but um, there is this group of mosaics that has been um, excavated and they they're of an absolutely unique workshop really special um and um and and uh, we have offered to to help develop a uh a, a program to uh, restore and preserve them so that uh, people can actually see them in situ they're incredibly delicate um and so uh, hopefully, hopefully, we'll, um, hopefully that will really put Sinop on the map as far as and there's five villas. <laughs> so it's it, it's a lot and it's exciting and and um, well, well, we'll see, um, you know, everything, uh, everything depends on um, well, first of all, of course, the, the getting over the virus. Uh, second of all, it, everything depends on securing the right balance of buy-in from the local and national uh, government. And then, um, and, and then the third uh, leg of the tripod is support. Um, I am particularly uh, keen. One reason I'm so excited to work with TASC is because I want to bring this exciting news to the Turkish American community. And I want to encourage members of the Turkish American community uh, to, to help celebrate all this exciting news and support this exciting uh, results from Turkey uh, if, if they feel uh, in, in a position to do so. Um, and so the, the third leg of the tripod is support. You know, I will try to reach the Giresunlu organization and hopefully get his, uh, get their president to come and talk to us and, uh, and see uh, and bring the interest to the Black Sea community in the, in the, in the United States. Uh, in your mind, now the eastern and the western Turkey, the Aegean coast, has been really worked on for many, many years. This Black Sea 
uh, excavations are relatively newer. Is that is that so? I mean, Troy started with uh, uh, Schlieven years in the last century. When did the Black Sea Coast really started to be excavated seriously? I, I mean, 1996 is when you started the Sinop. How much work was done previously by other archaeologists in other parts of the Black Sea? Well, I guess uh, in Sinop and the Central Black Sea, that was the first area that really, um, uh, that there were some sustained efforts uh, at, um, at doing archaeology. And, and um, of course, uh, one of uh, the famous Professor Ekrem Akurgal's first sites was actually Sinop. Um, he excavated together with um, with a German colleague uh, Ludwig Buda uh, in uh, in Sino uh, from 1951 to 1953, uh, and uh, and in many ways that's the the baseline for uh, his excavations all over the city. Um, you know uh, there there was a lot of, of wonderful potential back then because uh, a lot of places that are now built up. Uh, were uh, were uh, available for examination. Um, so uh, Professor Akergal, who who actually was one of our uh, one of our sort of benevolent ancestors back in 1996 when we began. Um, actually, one of the first things we did was we went and we spoke with Professor Akergal, who who gave us his his uh, blessing, and it was a um, he, he was a a, a really a, a, a wonderful figure in Turkish archaeology. Um, then in the 1960s uh, and seven, uh, or early 70s, I guess, um, uh, Bahadur Alkum uh, and Ender Bilgi started working at the famous Bronze Age site and Calcolithic site of Ikiz Tepe, right in Bafra. And they, uh, they worked there for decades uh, creating, uh, I would say, the first sustained project uh, in the region. Um, then, uh, if you fast forward to the early to mid 90s, uh, we started in Sinop in 1996. Before that, um, a, a couple of years before that, uh, a, a French team uh, led by Yvon Garlin and Dominique Kassab Tesger. Uh, uh, investigated a series of amphora production sites. Um, that was uh, that was a very uh, interesting uh, project. Uh, and then uh, Stephen Hill from University of Warwick uh, excavated a series of uh, churches, or early Byzantine churches, um, uh, as well. And so, so when we first got to Sinope. It was pretty busy, you know. There were a lot of different things going on. Uh, it was an exciting time. Um, it was only a couple of years after the fall of the Iron Curtain, and really, I, I think uh, I, I think the Black Sea coast at that point was a kind of no man's land because of the the tensions of the you know geopolitics of the Cold War. Um, but but uh, in in the 90s things were obviously coming along in really interesting ways. Um, our uh, survey uh, ran from 1996 till 2000, and then we had a couple little ones, and then from 2010 to 2012, and then after the that second group of surveys, that's when we really started to work on getting the permission to dig Sino. Kale. Um, yeah, so that, that, I guess that's uh, sort of a, a mini history of archaeology in, in Sino. Um, One last question before we take too much of your time. Well, it is not to do with the archaeology, but what do you think is going to happen with the Sakarya, uh, the, the big energy? 
discovery, uh, uh, natural gas discovery, uh, just uh, north of Sakarya in the Black Sea. So mm-hmm. how is that going to affect? I think they very soon they're going to start to develop that site and uh, and get the uh, wells out of the sea, I think. So how would that impact the whole area? Do you have any, do you hear any, uh, any plans? I mean, that, that, that's not something I can really uh, add very interesting knowledge to. I, I mean, I'm, I, I suppose the whole um, wild scene that's going on now with the mucilage, again, is, is a good reminder that we need to be careful about maintaining ecological balances because you know what what some people do impacts everybody and and so I'm, you know i I'm, I'm not in a position to <laughs> advise policymakers or, or or stump for one approach or another um, in fact i rather studiously avoid such things because um, I'm an archaeologist, <laughs> but um, but you know, I I suppose uh, it's important to keep in mind um, the big picture, and the big picture involves everybody, not just um, you know certain target people who might gain something. So, in you know. Sometimes archaeologists want to focus on our, how important the archaeology is, and and, and they and they, they forget that, you know, people need the same lands to build houses or to, uh, to 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 you know, <laughs> make their life livable in some way, you know, uh, you know, we all have to learn how to live together, and yeah. and to bring bring the different kinds of profit together for for everybody's benefit i suppose but but i'm i'm saying that just as a general person i i'm certainly not in a position to to make learned comments on on things like that. but it will have probably bring more traffic and of course the energy find is a huge huge plus for Turkey because we buy 70% of our energy from outside. So now you have it within your waters with nobody bickering around you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I bet when they go into setting up the uh, trying to get the gas out, they will find some shipwrecks because apparently Black Sea is uh, is, uh, full of shipwreck, well-preserved ones. <clears throat> because of the any obesity. any body of water w- where people have taken ships and which has nasty weather <laughs> will have shipwrecks. And yes, so uh, it, yes, um, uh, it's a it's a fair chance that some um, some wrecks will be encountered. Um, to my mind, uh, the you know the the big picture. I mean, it, it, it's, it really is heartbreaking to see uh, the, some of the ecological, um, you know, yeah, damage, sure right? And, yes. and, and, but, you know, we have to, it, it, somebody has to figure it out. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to claim great wisdom. Thank you so <laughs> much. You sure. were wonderful as usual. And I'm so glad we had this opportunity. Uh, it's even better than doing to a small group of people now. The link on this program will be available for a long time, and we can use it anyway. And much more, more many more people will be able to view this. And thank you again, and we'll be in touch, and uh, we'll want a progress report from you uh, again in uh, six months or so, what's happening in the Black Sea. But I'm happy. Yes, thank you again. And uh, a big hello to all the California friends. Thank you. Take care. You too.
Thank you.